like 50 minutes we're going to speak to Jason Larkin, the photographer, and I will leave some time at the end for questions and to see if you have any. I will start off with introducing you, Jason, and then you will show some of your images uh, so that the audience who hasn't seen them knows what we're talking about. You are a British photographer photographing people as if uh, were they landscapes and landscapes if, as if they were people. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's what I thought the first, the first time I saw your images. Uh, you are now 37, have lived and worked in Egypt and South Africa. You are, I would say, at the moment one of the most successful in the field where social documentary exposing current affairs and art collide in that sort of genre. You have received like millions of awards and grants. I, I, I did make some effort, I wanted to mention some of them, but I, no, I think I just, <laughs> I'll just say that. And you exhibit all over the world. And this image here is from the series Waiting that is on display in Lanskjona here in Teaterparken uh, at the moment. And they are taken in Johannesburg, uh, Johannesburg when you live there. And these people are actually waiting and they are also a metaphor for waiting, because that's what you saw when you lived there, that many people are like waiting for their lives to start. Uh, uh, they are saying something about the individual and also the context, as I think many of your, much of your photographic work has that, the, the human being in, in his or her context. Uh, I think it's something that we all can relate to also in uh, different ways. You have also told me that your mum, who was a prominent and promising ice skater, had to give up her dreams uh, about skating. And that has made you more dedicating to pursuing your dreams. <laughs> and so I wanted to start off with asking you, and then we can look at some, some of the pictures, how, how do you feel it's going? When, if, if you're going to look at, have you been able to pursue your dreams? Are you pleased with where you're at now? Sure. No, no, I mean, it's, I think for me, um, the movement that I've had in my life and the different places that I've visited is, yeah, it, I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to um, jump to these different spaces and I guess dedicate my time. You know, sometimes it's felt quite selfish, um, kind of moving to Egypt and, and, and just kind of immersing myself in Egyptian culture and then moving to South Africa. Um, but I guess that's the, that's, that's the great beauty of photography um, and being able to marry both a lifestyle and a, and a sort of workspace um, through your own interests is, is a great privilege and uh, you know uh, being able to sort of tackle some of these stories along the way and, and, and also for audiences to respond to the work and to yes actually want to see it is, is a huge privilege. So yeah, no, I'm very, very yes. happy. And I think that this also has something to do with these images. And I think that we all can relate to this because it's for everyone in our lives, it's like we have to wait for things. We have to wait for, it, it, you have this constant feeling of your, your life is uh, about to start for real, like the next week or the next month or something. And that is, uh, a bit untrue, but also sometimes true. You have to wait uh, for things to happen. You can't just decide everything yourself. And what I thought about your, your images from Johannesburg is that uh, we're a bit better off in a society like Sweden. You can go to school and you can do this and you can pursue your dream in, in perhaps a little bit more. But the people, I mean, generations of people who have lived in a society that has more conflict. So they have to, they have to keep waiting. Mm. Yes. I, I think for, for me that's what became quite interesting about the project, although there are very unique individual stories behind every individual that's waiting here, mm. um, one of the reasons why the way that you see the work here with just the time period is actually the only way you experience the work. Mm. You don't learn anything more about each individual in each photograph. And I did that because I wanted people to think about the act of waiting more and for there to be a better, stronger connection with waiting is a universal act, right? It's not explicit to, it's not um, something that's just inherent within South African society, 
the duration of the waiting is something that is quite specific to people within Johannesburg. And of course, you know, every country... Also in Egypt, perhaps, and in all cultures, sure. of course, but more. Does this uh, create a lot of frustration? Uh, I mean, the more yeah. you have to wait for yeah. things to come in place or what yeah. to do with your life. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, for 90% of the population, you know, under apartheid, they were waiting for 50 years for change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess it's that continuing idea of, um, of, of, of waiting for something to happen and something to change. And obviously, a huge amount has happened for quite a few people, um, you know, housing, electricity, water, like really basics. Um, there is still a lot of um, space for change and there's a lot of people that um, are sort of continually living a, a legacy of the past. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of my work tries to seek and sort of engage with is a legacy. Um, so, you know, just to give a bit of a background to um, what's happening in these, these, these pictures is everybody's waiting. It started with the idea of how people move across the city. Um, because the movement of people is very much determined by the geographical zoning that happened in apartheid. Um, when the whites decided they wanted a certain neighbourhood, they would just remove everybody and place them somewhere else. Mm. So the townships that exist around Johannesburg are all very, very far away mm. and actually much closer to the mining um, and industry. It, it, yeah, are they still living in sort of a temporary? Because that's what apartheid did to many people. They were like moving them around. So, so their lives became very temporary. Yeah. Yeah, they were waiting for the next thing. I mean, Is that I think I think there were a lot of people that lived in like shanty townships, yes. and there still those do still exist, and there are some people that are still waiting for formal housing. Mm -hmm. But the last twenty years, RDP housing is called. It's like um, the rural development program um, to be able to house people in physical houses with running water and electricity. Mm -hmm. I think it's like eighty percent of the country has got that. So there's you know huge mm -hmm. changes have happened, mm -hmm. but. You know, so the people that are waiting for public transport, um, say like this lady, um, she lives in Soweto, mm -hmm. and that bus will take an hour and a half to get her from where basically the offices, um, where lots of people you know come in to work in those offices, mm -hmm. it will then take her an hour and a half to get home. So she spends three hours on a bus, but the bus system is still very informal as well. So that's why she's kind of waiting. And a lot of these people are waiting in not formal sort of bus stops. It's just wherever you can on the side so of the, the road. Bus stops. They don't really. There is a couple of buses, like formal buses, that are run by the city, but they're yes. incredibly inefficient. Okay. So for the most part, people move through this informal bus system that was created during apartheid, yeah. and is now formalized, but it's still very informal. There's not like it's not the state doesn't have any control in that bus okay. system, that's and that's how most people move. That's sort of interesting, I mean, compared to another sort of society where all our bus stops are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We you know can't... where they are, but these are yeah. kind of norms. Yeah. These are like values. Yeah. Right? We, we think we have a bus yeah. stop here, so we'll wait here. Huh? So, so these are leftover legacies from apartheid. So it's not just um, where they're waiting, what they're waiting for, it's why they're waiting. Okay. Um, but, you know, that, that movement of people is obviously um, hugely impactful, right? If you're spending three hours of your day to get to yes. a job, you're cutting out family time, you're cutting out all these other things. Yes. So there's these kind of big implications from that legacy. Um, but I, even though I had all this information for each individual, I felt like bringing this work to another audience outside of South Africa, people would maybe get too caught up in that perspective on its own. Okay. And actually think, oh, you know, that idea of like this other and feeling sad for the other and, um, you know, not really sort of being able to own or, or, or relate to that yes. work and those situations. Let, let me ask you about that uh, firstly, because isn't that something that a documentary photographer always have to deal with? You want to, often you want, you want fairness, you want justice, you want uh, to, to feel with these people that they, they should, they deserve justice and a fair world also. But what you often evoke still is uh, sadness also and uh, mm. like, uh, I mean, it's difficult yeah. to get around that, that people will feel sad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely some of my projects 
dip into that sadder side of things. I, I, I tend not to get too uh, involved or, 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 or too enthusiastic about photography that portrays very specific emotions. I think a lot of my work is slightly more removed and slightly more interested in the bigger picture and less about an individual situation. Um, as I, you know, kind of a big thing with this series is, of course, these these people are standing in the shadows themselves, right? I only photograph people that were had found shadows to wave within. I have not placed them into the shadows, so just so that everybody's very very clear about that. Um, but these shadows remove their identities, and I sort of like that as well because there's a huge population in South Africa that are waiting. It's not just these individuals, and even these individuals, when you think about a relation, uh, a reality within South Africa are in quite a good place, they have jobs that they're moving to and from for the most part. Yes. Um, so th there's this idea of sort of um, a, a sort of wider uh, situation yes. that these people can sort of infer and kind of be, be related to. Mm -hmm. So we don't know her name, we don't know her situation, she's in the shadows, um, her identity's kind of been hidden um, from the act of what, that she, how she is waiting. And I, and I, I kind of like the idea that that connects to a uh, sort of bigger section of what's happening in society in South Africa. Yeah. And then just leaving the title as waiting, right? Like, yes. In some ways, this backstory only comes out when in this sort of situation. Yes. Yes. But hopefully, with, you know, the book is just waiting and the time period. Everybody knows. It's also what's in the aesthetics of the aesthetics, not only the shapes, but the aesthetics you have chosen. Mm. And they, I think that the Christopher Hitchens once said that you should ask for dignity, not empathy, uh, for for people, uh, for yourself and mm. for other people. And that's what I thought about your images. But yeah. could you, 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 you mustn't forget. You have to tell us something about exactly how you did, how you did take these images, because yeah. you wonder. You always wonder. Uh, how they must have seen you, you must have been sort of rather close. Oh, no, no, I mean, there's a conversation with each of these people, right? It's, okay. it's, 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 it's not, I mean, just the act of a white person walking on the streets in Johannesburg yes. will make people on the streets slightly alarmed. Like, that doesn't happen. That's, that's a kind of a sad reality of Johannesburg. So, yes. everybody has cars and is zipping around. So, um, I was basically driving around and I was driving around Johannesburg only during the months, the weeks, when it's so hot that people do this, that they wait in the shadows. For the most part, Johannesburg isn't that hot a city. Yeah. Um, so I would, yeah, just move around the city and just look for people who are waiting in the shadows. And for the most part, it's during the rush hours, in the morning or in the afternoon. Um, I would pull over and approach these people and just find out what they're waiting for. Um, but you know. they, they look relaxed, they don't look as if you, you, can't, you can't really see, it. in some of them you see some sort of tension of being mm. photographed, mm. but you, they still, did you, did it take you a long time, did you talk to them for, for a while, or how yeah. did you, you, yeah. you explain that you have yeah. this uh, project, you're yeah, photographing yeah. people, course, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean I, I was really interested in what they were waiting for, how long they were waiting, where were they going? Um, how often do they wait in this situation? Do they always wait in this place? Um, and after 10, 15, 20 minutes, you know, 50% of the participants said no to a photograph when I would then ask oh, afterwards. Like Probably like 50, 60%. Okay, 50, yeah. 60. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, people, people who were waiting for a bus, the bus would come up and yeah. I would obviously yes, let them yes. get on the bus. So I wouldn't get that portrait. <laughs> yes. um, but but I, I guess this, you know, so that person there for nine hours was waiting for customers. So he wasn't waiting for a bus, he was oh, just okay. waiting for customers. Okay. The guy for seven and a half hours, he was waiting for money. Okay. There's a girl right at the start for two minutes. Yeah. She was just waiting to cross the road. Yeah, okay. oh. So there's, there's all sorts of different realities yeah. of, of, of why people wait. And I think by stripping back that information, I, I wanted people from all over the world to be able to turn around and think about waiting. Mm just have a little bit more. If you can spend two minutes thinking, God, I got really angry waiting for like one minute at a bank mm -hmm. and someone's waiting six hours to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Like there's just that sort of 
reality perspective that can come through. Um, and you know, I do really, I'm very sensitive to the idea of taking images from other parts of the world and repositioning them outside. You know, a lot of my work, I always concentrate on how to keep that work in the country that I made, made it in. So a lot of my publications are bilingual, they're distributed for free within those communities. Okay. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of how I'm reflecting on an other space that isn't my space. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I think I bring a bit more dignity maybe to these people because they're anonymous in a way. And it is just this countrywide reality that's also a sort of universal reality and a universal act that like everybody waits. Um, it's, it's also, it's just really maybe that time difference in how we wait. Um, you know, maybe someone's here is waiting for somebody else to come up on the stage and talk and they're just sitting here, <laughs> you know, maybe someone's, you know, th yeah. there are lots yes, of people yes. I'm sure waiting within Sweden to get papers, to get, yes, yes, you know, yes. so there's lots of different ways that we can think about waiting. Um, yes, and there's this meme on the internet, I'm sorry for interrupting, do you know it, waiting like a Swede? No. Uh, we wait, uh, we're, obviously, I don't know if it's true, if it's only a myth, but we wait, uh, we have the biggest space apart from each other while we're waiting on things. Uh -huh. So while we're waiting for the bus, they have measured different cultures, huh. and we wait, uh, we have the biggest space from, well, each other. Yeah, from each other. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you Google it, you said waiting like a Swede, and there's these like, rather horrible images wow. of people standing like 10 meters apart when the bus is stopping there. I don't yeah. know if it's true though. Uh, uh, but I wanted to ask you also because I, I thought about, we talked a bit about that, and this is, I think, my favorite image because she looks so vulnerable. Uh, but um, that you, you, you're almost trying to protect them. Uh, it, it, it feels like that when I watched these images the first time. I, I thought about, I always used Diane Arbus as some sort of, she's at one end, she's very confrontative in her, in her images. She like seeks people out and gets on top of them and she creates good, very good images. And I think that Cartier Bresson has said that you have to be brutal in the moment or so. And this was like the opposite. You, you uh, manage to keep your own integrity, you don't have to come forward in a brutal way, and also the ones who photographs integrity. And I think it's kind of comforting to see that, because I think that many photographers and young photographers think that they cannot become mm. photographers if they don't have that sort of brutal dimension to their uh, characters. Mm. What do you think I mean, about that? It's, it's really interesting to hear, and it's, it's a, you know, it sounds it's a compliment. I feel. Um, I mean, for me, this 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 type of an image in particular is to sort of show context as well. I think a lot of my pictures, I tend to pull back. I mean, this is the first series I've ever made of just people. Yeah. Nearly all of my projects before have been very much involved with the landscape and the the, the reality of people living within that landscape. Yeah. Um, so for me, this was a bit of a departure in terms of where my work has, has been um, you know, for the last five or six years. Um, but so I, I, I do, I feel, I feel sensitive every time I approach somebody and take their photograph. I'm very like, aware of me jumping into this person's space. Um, you know, I like my own space. I don't want people to be kind of up in my face. And I, I'm... You know, I, I came from photojournalism and there was a lot of scenes within that world that I found very ugly and very kind of, um, I wanted to distance myself from, from some of the things that I saw and the behaviours of the photographers. Mm -hmm. And I do realise that sometimes there is a bullish kind of character that needs to be there and you need to sort of drop your inhibitions and, and just go for it to get those, those types of images. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm playing to my strengths and, and, and kind of trying to move away from my weaknesses. So pulling back a little bit, um, seeing that bigger picture, um, seeing that environmental context, uh, it, it is really important for me. Um, so in the process, I feel a little bit distant from some of my subjects. I also, for, you know, for me, the, 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 the composition of this image is a no-brainer, right? It's like a sundial as well. So there's a sort of like the idea of time 
um, yes. actually a physical alignment with that shadow. Yes. How do you do that? Because I know that many uh, of the people who visit the Kuna <laughs> Festival are, uh, are technically skilled in photography. How, how did you do Have you strengthened them uh, in Photoshop or you, have you used some kind of device on your camera to make them, to make the lines so straight? Uh, what, what kind of camera do you use? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of order. Um, yes. So, so uh, things are, I mean, you know, obviously every now and then you don't have exactly a flat plane. I don't work on a tripod, I just no. I work with a medium format camera that's very oh, mobile. Handheld. Medium. Handheld. It's a Mamiya 7, so it's a very light, it's a sort of traditional film camera for documentary photographers. Yes. Um, it, it's very like, I don't know, it's, it, it doesn't seem so overwhelming, I think, for a lot of participants of my photography projects no. when you pull out that camera. And it just means I can just sort of move around and just frame things up. And, okay. um, but you so, need a lot of light, I suppose, to get. I mean, you have to be in a. Well, the, light. Well, this is the beauty of this project, right? It's it's in the the harshest points of the day where the shadows are the strongest, and and obviously the heat strong. So, um, and it's it sort of seems counterintuitive because a lot of photographers you want that sort of golden light, and it's much lower light if you look at. Tales from the City of Gold, that's how it's shot, and Curry Divided, it's all very low light. Um, so it felt weird to be out in this quite harsh light, but that's actually what I wanted. I want to exploit those shadows. Have so you done that before also? Have you been, because that, I think, is also such a myth that you have to wait for the morning light or the, mm. the light at dusk to, to, that is easier. But I mean, many photographers seek out the harshest yeah. light and the deepest shadows. No, no, I, I think I've also always um, being, yeah, I guess I, a lot of my landscape work, I, I sort of deal with the idea of the slight sublime, you know, the idea that you can entrance people by the beauty of the photograph mm. to, for them to then linger more on what the subject of that photograph is, you know, I think the two can work very, very well with each other and, and should work very well with each other yes. to keep audiences, to keep engagement. Um, I guess I've just reversed that.